So I want to welcome you to the Pennsylvania Avenue Resource Center as Park as they call it, and another evening of history in the park. I'm Luchana Spraker with the city's municipal archives department. Tonight, I'm pleased to have Dr. Martha Kieber, who will be discussing Flora Butler Abbott Sangstack from slavery to the Chicago Defender. Before I introduce Dr. Kieber, I wanna mention a few things. If you have a cell phone, please make sure it's turned off. Um, and also, I wanted to um, make sure you knew the Municipal Archives just installed a new exhibit in City Hall's Rotunda. It's open to the public Monday through Friday from 8.30 until 5. It's called Laws Murphy's, works by Christopher Murphy Jr. from the WW Law Art Collection. The exhibit's going to be on display through June and features watercolors collected by WW Law. Um, that documents Savannah's African American churches and neighborhoods. Um, and I mention this because it ties into our history program for next month, and that's going to be Telfair Museum curator Courtney McNeil. She's going to delve into the artist Christopher Murphy, who did these pieces. And that program is going to be on Wednesday, February 26, at noon at City Hall, so a daytime program. And that's going to be an opportunity to um, hear from Courtney McNeil and then also um, see the exhibit at the same time. And um, somebody asked about how I announce those. I send those announcements out via our listserv. Um, and if you're not on it, you can write it at the bottom of the program evaluation I left on the chairs. So um, there's uh, a seat up here if you need one. And I see you found one back there. OK. So turning our attention to tonight's program, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Martha Kieber for several years now, as she's worked on several projects for the city of Savannah. And she's also been a great patron and supporter of the Municipal Archives. Dr. Kieber re received her BA degree in history from the University of Redlands and a PhD degree from Emory University. She's a French historian by training, and she spent most of her university career teaching at Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville, Georgia. A growing interest in the history of coastal Georgia led to the publication of her work, Seas of Gold, Seas of Cotton in 2002, and that's a biography of Christophe Poulain du Bignon of Jekyll Island. Since retiring in 2005, she has worked with the city of Savannah to preserve the history of changing neighborhoods through an initiative led by the city of Savannah's cultural affairs department. She wrote a history of three African-American neighborhoods in western Savannah under the title of Low Land and the High Road, published in 2008, followed in 2011 by Ebb and Flow, Life and Community in Eastern Savannah. I meant to bring some copies to show you tonight, but they are digitized and on the Municipal Archives website, so I can show anybody those um, if they'd like the link. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kieber now, and um, then at the end I'd, I'll share a couple of other things with you. So Dr. Kieber? Good evening, everybody. I think we have with us some um, students. Could someone tell me where you're from? <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm from uh, Sparhawk High School in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Well, we're, we're very impressed. You came all that way just to hear about Flora Senstack. That's, that's impressive. So. Specifically for this one presentation. Well, how, how thoughtful. Thank you, though, very much. We're pleased to have you with us. Let me introduce Flora Butler Abbott Sinstack. I want to take every precaution to make sure all the names matter here because this person may not be familiar to you, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but she is an important part of Savannah history. Now, before we get started, let me just suggest a couple of ideas to keep in mind as we talk about her life. First of all, think of her as an eyewitness, because she lived through slavery. From the time she was born until she was 17, when she was freed, she lived slavery. <coughs> to give you an idea of what her significance is, Think about the 7,700 slaves who lived in Savannah in 1860. 
What do we know about them? Not much. Precious little. But what Flora Butler did was to remember the things that she went through as a child, as a young woman, and those memories have been preserved. She is an eyewitness to slavery in Savannah. That makes her very unusual because that glimpse is from the point of view of a child and from a young woman, from the female point of view. Secondly, she was the mother of Robert Abbott. And Robert Abbott was the editor, the publisher, the founder of the Chicago Defender. Through that newspaper, he became the very large voice for black America in the early 20th century. He became the man who brought racial discrimination and racial injustice to the forefront in many black communities. Her son took her lead in his life. Let's start at the beginning with Flora, and we will refer to her as her names change, and occasionally just as Flora. But she was born on December 27, 1847, and she was a daughter of Harriet Butler and Jacob Butler. This family was divided by slavery. Her mother, Harriet, was the property of Lucretia Spencer, and her father was the property of John Falligant. Children naturally went with the mother. In this divided family unit, there was hope, at least for Harriet and her children, because Mrs. Spencer said, when I die, Harriet, you and your children will be liberated. You will be free. It is written in my will. She died. It was in her will. Her nephew, who, in, who was the heir to the estate, ignored it and was ready to sell the family. But Jacob, uh, Jacob went to his uh, proper to his owner, John Falligan, and he pleaded, please buy my family. And John Falligan did. So the family was reunited, thanks to John Falligan. As for Flora Butler, who is a, a toddler at this time, she will move to Broughton Street from the first home that she had with Mrs. Spencer. Uh, originally, her first home was at what today would be at the corner of Park and Whitaker. This is before Forsyth Park, but she was born right around that intersection. She now moves to Broughton Street on the east end, and she will be under the direction of Mrs. Falligan, Sarah Falligan. At the age of nine, Flora Butler is given the task of being a nursemaid for the three younger Falcon girls. This turned out to be a tremendous advantage for Flora Butler because inadvertently she learned how to read and write. Now, the importance of this has to be put in context because in that day and time, if you taught an enslaved person how to read and write, it was a crime. If you're a white person, it's a $100 fine. If you are a black person, it is 39 lashes, the maximum number of lashes that would be imposed on one day. This is serious business because whites certainly did not want to open the doors of learning and knowledge to their slaves. Harriet Butler did teach her daughter, Flora, the ABCs, but that's it. She never wrote them down. She never showed uh, Flora how to read, how to write, but it was to the advantage of Flora when she was 
with these young Falcon girls, kneeling at the table where they did their homework and read their stories and their lessons. And on her knees, she would go around the table and she would look and observe what was happening. She would look at the letters. She would listen to what the girls said and she learned how to read. And eventually she learned how to write. One of the girls, the Falcon girls, went to boarding school and Flora wrote her a letter. Mrs. Falcon was astonished. How did you learn how to read and write? She said, smugly, I think. I taught myself. She's smart. But she's not only smart, she's spunky too. Uh, one thing that she recalls is when she was walking down Broughton Street one day, doing an errand for Mrs. Uh, Falligan, and she spied through the grate of Broughton Street in front of a storefront, down at ground, uh, in the basement level, she saw a shiny dime. A dime? I mean, that was a lot of money. And she asked the store owner, may I have the dime? And he said, if you can get it without moving the grate. She thought about that. And just so happened, someone else heard that offer. And that was Hammy Branch. Hamilton Branch is his real name, but everybody on Broughton Street called him Hammy. He was a little boy, uh, not too much uh, different in age than Flora. Hammy had an idea. He went home, got his fishing pole, put some chewing gum on the hook, fished through the grate, got the dime, pulled it up, and Flora snatched it. And she ran all the way home with Hammy Branch right behind her. Now, when she got home, Flora told Mrs. Falgan what had happened. And Mrs. Falgan looked at Hammy Branch and gave him a, a very commanding look. She said, now listen, the storekeeper promised that dime to Flora, so you go home. You don't bother Flora anymore. And Hammy did. Hammy was a white boy. Hammy will go on to become a Confederate soldier. Hammond, Hamilton, I guess we should say, supposedly is a model for the soldier on top of the Confederate monument in Forsyth Park. Anyway, let us fast forward because we're going to take ourselves to December of 1864. Flora Butler is almost 17 years old. Mrs. Falligan is now widowed and she is terrified because she hears that Sherman and the Union troops are close to Savannah and she hears a noise outside. Someone is rattling her gate. Mrs. Falligan runs out and she says, don't batter down my gate. I hear the Yankees are coming. And the man looks at her slyly and says, I am the Yankees. Mrs. Falligan hurried inside and told Flora quietly, take the silver and hide it in the attic. Shh, be quiet. Flora did, but she made a ruckus doing it. She scraped the wall, she made noise, and she said, it did me good to make, see her so scared. Well, a couple of days later, Flora was doing an errand for Mrs. Falligan, and a Union soldier came up to her and said, you are free. She didn't know. The soldier said, go home to your uh, to your home and you tell your owner that you are free and demand for your owner to pay you wages. Can you possibly imagine what a shock this would have been? She does go home, but she doesn't have the courage to confront Mrs. Falligan. She slips out the door. 
and she finds work elsewhere and finally finds a good job uh, with the wife of the Georgia Gazette editor. Uh, there she finds a woman who treats her like a sister, not like a slave. But her life is going, Flora Butler's life is going to take a tremendously big change around 1866. She will meet a man, Thomas Abbott. Thomas Abbott was a, a man of a commanding appearance and demeanor. He came from St. Simon's, where he had been a slave, but he was by far the most important man on the plantation for the slaves. But he was equally important for the Stevens family because he directed the work of the plantation. Here was a man who was charming, intelligent, and knew his importance. And he liked Flora. They had a whirlwind uh, courtship. And Thomas Abbott decided his job as a surveyor in Savannah wasn't the best. So he took his bride back to his home in St. Simons, and he said, we're going to have a grocery. We're going to make lots of money, because now the freedmen have money to buy groceries. So they did. Flora worked very hard. She learned how to handle the money. Uh, she became pregnant right away and gave birth to a daughter who died after two months of life. By this time, Thomas Abbott is spending most of his time in Savannah, drinking up what little profits they had and being at home seldom. Flora becomes pregnant again. And when it comes time for her delivery, her husband is in Savannah. Her in-laws believe she's not good enough for the likes of Thomas Abbott and will not lay a, uh, a finger to do anything to help her. She delivers her baby by herself, a fine baby boy by the name of Robert. Four months later, Thomas Abbott dies of TB. So here's a young woman, early in her 20s, a widow with a baby. She goes to Savannah. She and her mother find a place to live. Her mother takes care of the baby while we'll find Flora is now a nursemaid. Now, the place where they found lodgings was on Fom Street, which I'm sure many Savannians know about. And Fom Street at that time was not exactly a, a desirable address. On Fom Street, you have brawls, you have bar rooms, you have brothels. And it went on from there. But the lodgings that Flora Abbott and her mother found were okay. Her landlord was a young man named John Senstack. He was running to school there for black children and for black adults who did not know how to read. And he appreciated their dilemma because he himself had been born a slave in Savannah. But he grew up in Germany. His father was a German merchant, and his mother was a slave. When John Sensack's mother died, she told her husband, although they could not marry, she said, you must take our children where they will be free. And the children went to Germany. They were raised in Germany. John Sinstack spoke German. He was well-educated. He had sailed the world. 
He came back to Savannah to see what happened to his father's estate and decided that his race needed him as a teacher. Now, John Zinstack was quite intrigued with his new tenant. We're going to find that Flora Zinstack impressed her landlord because she could read and write. And he said, if you will give up your, your job as a nursemaid, I will pay you to help me teach the little ones during the day. She was delighted. And she also discovered that John Sinsdak spoke German, and so did she, because she knew some of the German merchants in Savannah. She could carry on at least a simple conversation. And as things happened, as Flora rather shyly says, we grew fond of each other, and we married, this being in 1874. So Flora Sinsdak is now married again, and she finds in John Sinsdak a man who loves not only her, but loves her son as if he were her, his own. Shortly, the family will move to Woodville, and I'm not sure how many even native Savannians know about Woodville, but Woodville today is part of the city of Savannah. It's on the western uh, side of the city. And there, John Sinstack was able to fulfill his dreams. He had always wanted to be a minister, and there he founded his congregational church. But he also worked part-time for the Board of Education as a teacher for, a, uh, for the black children in the neighborhood. His hands were full teaching and preaching. And so were Flores and Stacks. She and John had eight children. Three of them died young, but these children were her life's work. And she was strict with them. She did not tolerate any horseplay at all. Um, her children certainly knew that, but so did the neighborhood children too, because Flora Sinstack when she heard the neighborhood boys getting rowdy, getting into something, uh, she'd go out and take a switch, and let me use her words, she would whale down those boys. She was the, the local enforcer. And the boys respected her, and when they were up to something, they, they made sure that Flora's Sinstack was nowhere to be seen with that switch in hand. Flora also spent a great deal of time with her oldest son, Robert Abbott. And she said that you must be the leader for the younger children. You must be the one to show them the way. Now, this is not to say Robert didn't have mischief. Oh, he did. Uh, he would sometimes pretend not to hear his mother call, and uh, he would pay for that. But at any rate, she said, you should set a good example. Get a job. You're eight years old. It's time. And he did. He worked at a grocery store in Savannah on Farm Street. And he stayed the whole week there. He would come home on Sundays. He earned 15 cents a week. And his mother deducted 10 cents for room and board. He got a nickel. And keep in mind that the school year for black children at that time was only five months. So seven months a year, he is working six days a week for 15 cents a week. Robert was one who quickly learned to be responsible. And he took his mother's example to heart. She taught him the important things in life. 
She taught him to love music. She taught him family loyalty. She taught him the value of education. She taught him how important it was uh, to live a good life. So she and her husband ensured that of all of their children, they all went to high school. Some of them went to college. Robert went to college at Hampton University, or then Hampton Institute in Virginia. But it wasn't enough just to send your children to school. It was important, both parents believed, to prepare your child for the world that is out there. And that world was getting more and more dangerous all the time. If the enslaved had become emancipated after the war, they quickly found that those rights were being slowly eroded and discrimination began to grow and grow and become more violent. In Savannah, to use just some, some examples, there was segregation proposed on the streetcars. Two boycotts ended that notion. The third time it didn't work. There was segregation at the Savannah Theater. African Americans could sit in the balcony, but not on the main floor. A boycott ended that. But there was other, sometimes insidious ways of segregation. If you went into court, there were two Bibles for you to swear an oath. One was for black people and one was for white people. John Zenstack particularly wanted his children to know what kind of world they were inheriting. And he started with Robert. One time, he and Robert were, were at the post office, standing in line, waiting their turn, when a white man cut in front of him. John said, no, you go to the back. We're making a line here. On another occasion, John took Robert to a courtroom where a black man was on trial. It was all a sham. The charges were not really true. But John wanted Robert to see what racial injustice looks like. And John would speak up for this defendant if he was allowed to in court. These were the kinds of lessons that Robert Abbott learned. But he paid particular attention to a lesson taught him by his stepfather. His stepfather, Reverend John Sinsack, said, the best defense for a people that is losing their civil rights is a newspaper. And so Reverend Sinsack showed him what he meant. Reverend Zenstack, in addition to being a teacher and a preacher, became a publisher. He established the Woodville Times. Now, it was four pages. It was mainly about local things. It was mainly about church happenings, people's comings and goings. But from time to time, he would include an article from the New York Times or from other newspapers. And he discussed these articles with his congregation and Sunday night services about the state of the race. Robert Abbott helped do some of the, the work on the Woodville Times. He had an apprenticeship at the Savannah, Savannah Echo, another black run newspaper. And when he got to Hampton, he decided he would focus on becoming a printer. When he graduated, he was at a bit of a loss. He went to law school in Chicago. He graduated and he founded that there were no jobs for black attorneys. So in 1905, when he was 36, 
he decided he would found a newspaper. He wrote the articles. He laid out the articles on his landlady's breakfast table. He hired a printer to print them, and then he went on the street and he sold the paper for pennies. But it was the nature of this paper that shocked people and got their attention because this paper that will be known as the Chicago Defender had fiery headlines. There was nothing milk toast about this newspaper. Robert Abbott wanted people to, be, to see the injustice around them and his headlines his script, his words were militant. He wanted people to be angry. He wanted people to be aware. And in World War, II, in World War I, he thought he found an opportunity. He said, when I go around Chicago and I look at the factories and I see sign saying, help wanted. Because you see, now in World War I, the immigrant ships from Europe weren't coming anymore. It was too dangerous. There were German submarines out there that made a transatlantic crossing too dangerous for immigrants to come to, the, to North America. And later on, people, young men, would be going to war. There were lots of jobs available. Robert Abbott began to write in his newspaper, Southern blacks should see the discrimination that they suffer. They know about the lynchings, and they know about the Klan, and they know about the low wages they have at home, and they know about the bold weevil that has torn away the cotton crops. Come north. Come north. There are jobs. It's safer. It may be as racist in its own way, but it is a better place for you and your family. And this is what became known as the Great Migration. And over the course of two or three years in World War I, something like two to three million African Americans moved north. Robert Abbas was at the head of this Great Migration Movement. He was the elegant eloquent prophet calling people north. Now this was not something that was without risk. If you lived in the state of Georgia, it was a crime to have in your possession a copy of the Chicago Defender. It was illegal. But nonetheless, the paper kept dribbling in to Georgia. Give thanks to the, rail, to the black railroad porters who would smuggle the newspapers on their cars and they would smuggle them out where other people would take them and share them. If you went to church on Sunday, black, black people would hear the words of Robert Abbott being read from the pulpit as the whole newspaper, newspaper was read aloud. You go to the barber shop, and people talked about it, and people read it, and people shared it. It's estimated for every paper that came south, it was read four or five times. Hundreds of thousands of people were exposed to the words of Robert Abbott. And even though things were bad, in Georgia, for example, essentially black people could not vote after 1908. But Robert Abbott is saying, there is an alternative. Come north. Do not take this kind of discrimination. Come north. Now, Robert Abbott did not dare to come to Savannah and to Woodville very often. It was much too dangerous. If he did come, he came in disguise. And so occasionally, his family would go to Chicago, where they were welcomed. And on one occasion in 1921, Flora Sinsack came to Chicago. 
And this is Flory Sinstack, standing proudly by the brand new printing press that the Chicago Defender had just bought. It was a great day for this newspaper to, for the first time, have its own printing press. And Flora Sinstack was there to celebrate with her son. In 1927, Flora Sinstack had a stroke. And she will never recover. Robert Abbott pleaded for his mother to come to Chicago. He said, I will build you a fine house. I will have servants and nurses, and you will want for nothing. Please, mother, come home with me. And she said, thank you, son. But I know when my time comes that my husband, your stepfather, he will come for me, and he'll never find me in Chicago. <laughs> so I'm going to stay right here in Savannah. And she did. She stayed with her daughter, Rebecca, on Augusta Avenue. And her convalescence, her lingering illness, lasted the better part of four and a half years. Part of her illness apparently was insomnia, and, and late at night, she would wake up and she would just start rem remembering things as they once were. We have a letter from Rebecca Sinstack to Robert, Robert Abbott. She called him Bub, and she said, Dear Bub, Mama's talking again. And she would talk all night. The letter was dated. And in addition, it said 3 a.m. But what she was talking about was what she remembered when she was enslaved, what she recalled of Savannah and her own experiences when she was a child and a young woman. And bless her heart, Rebecca Sensack wrote down those memories. And because of that, we have those memories available to us today. Flora Sinstack died September 21st, 1932. And she was buried next to her husband in Laurel Grove Cemetery South, which you can visit. It's a, a beautiful tomb, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, burial place provided with marble from Robert Abbott. Now, if you were to go out West Bay Street today, go over the viaduct, go by Hudson Hill neighborhood and West Savannah, and eventually to Woodville, and if you stop at the corner of Albion and West Bay, there's a historical marker. And that here's historical marker marks where Reverend Sinstack's church once stood, and where the Sinstack family home was. This is where Robert Abbott lived as a boy and as a young man. The boyhood family home is remembered in that uh, historical marker. And when I read that marker, there's no mention of Flora Sinstack, but in her own way, her life was just as remarkable as her son's. And as I read that, pa that plaque, it seems to me that this commemorates not only the great Robert Abbott, but the equally formidable Flora Butler Abbott Senstack. Thank you very much. Uh, these are in Chicago. So there's a collection of, of uh, family papers, mainly Robert Abbott papers, 
uh, in the public library in Chicago. So. Does that newspaper still exist today? Uh, it, it ended just about a year ago. It, it had declined um, after World War II, um, but especially after the death of John Sinstack, the uh, grandson of Reverend John and the nephew of Robert Abbott, uh, John Sinstack, um, the, the second, if you will, died in 18, uh, 1998. And, uh, since that time, the, the newspaper had taken various uh, different formats, and it finally uh, ended uh, in the last year. So. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just reading a Wikipedia entry. I don't know if it's accurate. It says that it's an online newspaper, so mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, it's carried out online. Um, my question uh, is, um, Robert Abbott was, and the Chicago Defender, was he um, consciously part of the socialist movement or just an just a human playing to it? Yes, the, the question is whether Robert Abbott was part of a socialist movement. Uh, he was accused of what was called red journalism uh, because he is militant, there's no doubt about that, but he was not uh, to my knowledge, in any way uh, influenced by Marxist-Leninist ideology. But he is, in his own way, very much a revolutionary. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Robert's sister, Rebecca, you said lived on Augusta Avenue. Yes. Is there any way for us to determine where on Augusta Avenue? The address is 259. Now, I'm not sure if the numbers have changed over the years, but in the 1930s, it was 259 Augusta Avenue. So that's a wonderful question and, and one I want to, to, to see if, if, if that is still the correct address and if the house is still standing, because it's important. And no, I know there's no 200 block on Augusta <coughs> Avenue now. Well, there you go. But I'm wondering if we could find some kind of research, you know. I am quite sure, and Luciana Spraker is nodding her head, her head uh, vigorously. We can find it out. Okay, I'll give it Luciana. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, so I have several questions. Okay. Uh, I've noticed the lady named Butler, mm -hmm. and I know that um, about the weeping time, Mm -hmm. All right, and the plantation out there along Augusta Avenue in, in that area. I'm wondering if there is any association. Could her origin, her birth, have been um, connected to that um, plantation at some time? Why the name Butler? And, mm -hmm. you know. So that's one of the questions. Um, second question. Okay. Um, might there be an association or intersection of philosophy? I'm thinking of the contemporaries. Um, Richard R. Wright from Georgia State Industrial College, mm -hmm. or Colored Youth, um, now Savannah State. Saul C. Johnson, another radical thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there might be others, but I'm thinking about those three. Um, and also another connection to West Savannah I'm thinking about. Um, another intersection, coincidence, serendipity. Uh, on Robert Street, mm -hmm. you had um, Mary McLeod Bethune, who once lived there on Robert Street. I'm thinking, how powerful is that for them to have lived in the same vicinity, if not in the same decade, but um, I think that might deserve some further research. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune was married here in Savannah, gave birth to her son Albert um, Jr. here in Savannah. Um, there are just so many things that we could further look at in terms of Flora Butler, her son Robert, and the Simstacks. Um, 
Those are all excellent questions, and, and I won't do justice to any of them, but very quickly let me say I doubt very sincerely that um, Flora Butler's family um, was related to those at the weeping time. The weeping time for our friends from Massachusetts uh, return, refers to what was probably the largest slave sale in the United States. Uh, and this occurred in Savannah, uh, not too far off of Augusta Avenue. Uh, when this occurred um, in the 1850s, the slaves who were auctioned off to potential buyers from all over the Southeast, uh, these people were owned by Pierce Butler, uh, whose plantation uh, was near Darien and his sister's plantation. Uh, just given the fact that Flora Butler's family was here in Savannah, I don't know of any geographical connection between the family. Um, so I would be not um, hopeful that there is that connection. Um, as for Robert um, Abbott's connection with Richard Wright, uh, the president of Savannah State, what will become Savannah State, and uh, Saul Johnson and others. Um, I don't know of any direct connection. I know that Reverend Sinstack um, did have a bit of a falling out with um, Dr. Wright at one point. Um, Saul Johnson. Yes. They did, yes. and the, and I don't think that Robert uh, Abbott was here often enough to really get into that uh, that uh, discussion. As for Robert Street, uh, one thing I didn't mention: the Sinstack Academy was right there on the corner of of Robert Street and Bay Street, and so it is a very historic street for all sorts of reasons, and obviously needs more work. But thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm curious about the Butler part, too, because my understanding was that enslaved people did not have last names, and they were not allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. So do you know how they came to have be married and have a last name? And was it the name of either of their owners? Right. Um, marriages could happen and did happen. Um, it mainly depended on you, the property owner. I hate to use that, that word, it's so harsh. But um, if, the, if the owner allowed it, there were marriages, even on the plantations when they did not live on the same plantation. It, it did happen. But um, you can't make any generalizations on that. It's, so they could just take the last name Certainly. Very often people would, would take the surname of their, uh, their former owners or something very different. So, One more question, John? Uh, I was wondering about birth records. I mean, in those days, for African American folks, if there were birth, birth records maintained or what, how would that work? How I wish it would be true. It would be, so much it would be uh, a blessing to us all, but no, there, there were not records. Occasionally, churches would keep numbers of how many children were in Sunday school uh, before the Civil War. Uh, but as for actual names, this is, is very rare. And it's, it's, it's a real problem if you are trying to do genealogy. Well, I thank you all so much, or one more, okay. How did you find Flora, and what piqued your interest to pursue this? Ah, why am I interested? Okay, when I was working for the city of Savannah, and I worked on uh, the West Side neighborhood, I ran into John Sinstack, and I said, what an incredible story, and I have been hooked ever since. So, anyway, I thank you all so much. Uh, thank you so much to Martha. I think it is a fascinating story, and it's always nice to hear women's stories, too. Um, 
you know, obviously the, uh, the white uh, rich stories often are the written stories, but even more so, I think the female stories get overlooked a lot. So we're trying to make a concerted effort this year um, with the uh, uh, 19th Amendment's anniversary to look at women's history a little bit more. I would ask you to fill out the program survey if you're interested in getting um, announcements um, uh, of upcoming programs. You can add your email to the bottom and I'll add you to our email listserv. Um, if you need a pencil to fill it out, there's some up here. And also up on that counter, I have a bookmark um, which has contact information for the archives. So if you haven't been using the municipal archives and you're interested in what we hold in terms of historical records, um, want to know how to find out where that 239 Augusta Avenue is, there's our contact information. And there's also a flyer about an online portal. We are trying to actively collect digitized information and narratives about different neighborhoods around Savannah because Savannah's got a wonderful and rich history and every neighborhood's got a little bit of a different story. So we really need our residents' help in trying to um, flesh out that history and make sure it's preserved for future generations. So if you're, you're so inclined, pick up a flyer um, with that online portal and share it with your friends and family and um, neighborhood associations. And I want to thank uh, Martha again for coming out this evening and sharing her information. Information. Thank you.